Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Tisky Sour. I'm Michael Walker. I am delighted to be joined by Aaron Bastani. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm very well. How are you keeping, Michael? I'm also very well. And we are at some point, hopefully, going to be joined by Grace Blakely. We're having a few technical issues at this point in time. But for now, we're going to go straight on to our first big story, uh, which is about Keir Starmer. Uh, we obviously, you know, did a big... Uh, we've done a few shows on Keir Starmer now, new leader of the Labour Party. He did a media round this morning. He's sort of coming out uh, with... Oh, he's, he's now establishing Labour's line on coronavirus, which is all about an exit strategy. Um, I think this is a kind of bizarre focus. That's something we're going to be talking about. Uh, but let's let's introduce Keir Starmer's point in his own terms first. So this is a letter uh, that the Labour leader wrote to Dominic Raab. Obviously, Dominic Raab is currently standing in uh, for Boris Johnson, who is in, well, he's not in hospital anymore, but he is recovering. So we can get up the key section from that letter, which has the demands. I am writing to urge that on Thursday you commit to the following setting out clearly the criteria the government will be using to inform how and when it intends to ease the lockdown measures, publishing the government's exit strategy now or in the coming week, so that when Parliament has returned from the Easter recess, it can be subject to proper parliamentary scrutiny, outlining the sectors, the economy and the core public services, e.g. schools, that you consider most likely to see restrictions eased. This should be accompanied by a clear plan to protect workers and family members as well as an assessment of the impact such measures will have on the economy and existing government support scheme. Um, I'm going to turn down my mic ever so slightly, and I'll keep you updated on what's going on with Grace. But uh, that letter, so, I mean, I think this all seems, to me, I'm not sure why Keir is focusing on this at this point in time. The government's line is that it's too early to be talking about an exit strategy as we haven't yet reach the peak of the wave and um, they're unclear as to exactly what would be peaking they haven't made it clear if that's deaths or if that's infections or if that's number of people in hospitals it makes a lot of sense if it's number of people in hospitals because obviously they've said their overriding aim is to not have the nhs overwhelmed um, those criticisms were put to keir starmer um, earlier this morning on bbc breakfast we're going to look now at how he responded I, don't, I, I disagree on that, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I think the government's wrong on that. I don't say that in any negative way. I understand the, judgments do, the government's doing a difficult job. But we do need to take the public with us. We need the public to comply, and therefore they need to know that the government has a strategy for what comes next. Um, and they need to know the government's planning for that. Uh, so that was Keir Starmer's um, answer uh, to a question about the, the, the government opposition. Um, so, I mean, yeah, this, this seems slightly strange to me. So the government, I mean, should, in theory, um, give its exit strategy for how it is going to get out of the lockdown. But for me, it seems odd for this to be a priority. Um, so there are still frontline workers in care homes without PPE. The government is still way behind on testing. Um, Non-essential workers are being forced into work. Those are more material demands that, I mean, I would be putting front and centre. People, you know, when you say this, people quite rightly say, well, Keir Starmer tweeted about this two days ago or four days ago. But the headline this morning on the BBC bulletins was Labour demands uh, the Tories publish their exit strategy, which just seems odd uh, in this particular political moment. Aaron, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I just think it doesn't mean anything. I mean, we've said it repeatedly on the show. We said it long before most journalists were saying it. This is a serious issue. Uh, but in any case, we don't quite know how serious because the virology of this still isn't entirely understood. We weren't aware of human to human transmission until January. Uh, we weren't really aware of the contagion of this and uh, mortality rates, uh, the extent to which it could travel across borders. It only really overwhelmed, you know, Chinese healthcare systems in, in late February in Wuhan, which is when Wuhan was was shut down. It was on February 24th that the Chinese authorities and the WHO said this is a serious, serious virus. This is a uh, an order of magnitude worse than SARS um, or, or the various other coronaviruses that have been out in the last over the last 20 years, really. MERS is another one. Uh, so the idea that you have an exit plan, I think, is just odd because the reality is. This is here to stay. Cold and flu season is now cold flu and coronavirus season. 
Uh, there's going to be one, two, three waves of this. There'll be more and more waves of this, seasonal waves, until we have a vaccine. Uh, and given all that, we don't know, for instance, uh, how long people remain immune for. You know, again, that we had that conversation about the antibodies tests. Well, the antibodies test is only really of any use if you know how long people have immunity after they've been subject to the virus. For some things, you only need to have it once, like chickenpox. Uh, for some things, like uh, cold or flu, you might have, you know, uh, immunity for a season or three months even. So there are so many open uh, questions regarding the virology, regarding public health. The idea that you would say to a politician, an elected politician who, who knows nothing about uh, epidemiology or virology or, you know, how, how these how these organisms, they're not organisms, viruses aren't alive, I keep on saying that, how, how these things operate, how this particular one functions, it just seems a really odd thing to say to me. What a politician should be doing, in my estimation anyway, is focusing on how you can minimise loss of life in the here and now, uh, while maintaining a semblance of a functional economy, making sure people can eat, access vital goods and services and so on. Those are the two things you need to be talking about, which means talk about PPE, talk about the economic package and talk about, you know, ramping up our healthcare infrastructure. To talk about the exit strategy, I just think it's not just politically in astute. I don't think it makes any sense. I suppose I disagree with you somewhat. I, I do think it makes sense. I do think it's a reasonable ask and I think what it's reasonable it, when it journalists mean? ask it. So what, what does, does it mean? mean? So so uh, there are a number of different ways that one can get out of a lockdown. So one could return to a kind of herd immunity strategy. That's something that, you know, the Toby Youngs of the world are, are promoting. And still, apparently, many people, you know, close to the government are, are saying that potentially we will just let this run wild um, or, you know, have a have a slow lockdown where you let some people back into certain industries you reopen schools, potentially you reopen some industries, but not others. And the idea would be that you let this virus run through, you know, the whole of society. But I said run right earlier, but the, the idea would be it would be in a controlled manner. So the ICU capacity in, in hospitals would never quite be overwhelmed. Um, so you'd have a situation, I suppose, a bit like now, um, but going over and over again for a couple of years until we've got herd immunity or a vaccine has come along. The other option um, is test and trace. So that's the idea that you sort of open up society um, once you've got transmission down to a really low level so that you can start to have a hope of isolating who's got the disease and then tracing the people they've been in touch with. I mean, that's if I were a Labour leader, I'd be you know heavily promoting the test and trace idea. It's what they've done in South Korea. It's incredibly successful. Obviously, that, what, the barrier what? that the government have to, to that is that they have to ramp up testing to a much, much higher degree than what they are currently capable of doing. Can I ask you, I mean, so that's a better response than what we're doing. We agree that's what should happen. That's not an exit strategy. We're not going to get rid of coronavirus if we start doing test and trace. There is still going to be coronavirus. There's still going to be multiple outbreaks of this thing. So I think just the language, exit strategy, it's been, it's been applied historically to military intervention. You go somewhere, you leave. We, we can't leave the problem of, of coronavirus until we have a vaccination, which will happen. You know, happen hopefully relatively soon in, in sort of historic terms. But for, for 12 to 18 months, talk of an exit strategy in the abs exit strategy. I think we actually agree on the policies here. That kind of language just seems to me generally unhelpful. You know, something might happen in South Korea. One person may re-enter the country and infect before we know it, 20,000 people. And you have to have another lockdown temporarily. Then you quickly go again to the track and trace approach. I, I agree with you. But you know, the presumption that you can just, we can exit this. Is it going to be three months or six months or three well, weeks? I, mean, when, to be, I, I just, mean, I just, to be don't, I just don't help. It's not helpful framing. It doesn't help the public understand the nature of the problem. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I could take the point that you might think it's not the correct word or the most helpful phrase to describe what one is talking about. But I mean, to be fair to Kirst Dummer, he's being clear that what he's talking about is the exit from the lockdown. Um, and the idea of an exit strategy from the lockdown has become quite widespread among sort of people who are commenting on this stuff on online and in, in newspapers. You're, you're quite right that potentially there are people in the public who, when they hear exit strategy, they interpret an, an exit strategy from coronavirus in general and test and trace isn't. Go back that. to normal. That's what it means. Go back. Go, for me, exit strategy means go back. To, when do we go, how do we go back to normal? How do we have economic life exactly as we had it before? You know, you, you can go to work, your kids go to school, you can buy or sell a house, you can go abroad that doesn't mean anything you know and i think we have to we have to now have a conversation about a permanently altered economy for for a couple of years and, and and there might not be huge alterations you know you may have far greater you might need particular paperwork if you're leaving or entering the country etc 
Uh, but th th that's the kind of conversation, I, you know, we're still not having a more, more than a month into this. Uh, I've got to apologize to our audience. We are not going to have Grace Blakely on tonight because of technological problems. Uh, one of the one of the downsides of doing these shows from lockdowns, it means that we can get people, you know, the upside is we can get people on quite easily from all over the world. The downside is that sometimes people's uh, technological equipment fucks up. Uh, so no Grace Blakely tonight, just me and Aaron Bastani. But uh, I mean, you know us, you know that we've got enough to talk about to fill an hour. Uh, we won't be struggling. Um, make sure you do read Grace Blakely's recent Navarra Media article on why Western nations should be uh, cancelling debt um, in the developing world. Um, that was one of the things we we're going to talk about tonight, but go read that article. Very good. Very well explained. Um, I want to now go to um, a defense of Starmer's position, which is from Stephen Bush. Um, and actually, this defense of, of Keir Starmer's strategy made me even more worried um, about Starmer's strategy. So can we get up this quote uh, graphic too? Um, so Starmer's exit strategy letter is based on taking the political hit up front, being criticized on all sides for banging on about exit strategy today so that he can benefit later. Even, either because an exit strategy cooked up behind closed doors fails to function, or more likely, because when the debate moves to the question of paying for all this, no one will be able to say that he wanted to rack up an even bigger bill than the Tories. Um, I mean, why this is disastrous <laughs> um, to me uh, is that one, I mean, it, it seems odd to be trying to bring up an exit strategy now so that when it goes wrong in the future, you can argue that was the wrong thing to do, especially as he isn't at this point in time saying what he would do for an exit strategy. So four weeks ago, Jeremy Corbyn was saying, I think we should enter into a lockdown earlier, fundamentally, um, and history has proved him right. But if he just said, I want to see your strategy, that would have been a, you know, a slightly weaker position. Um, also, I think the speed at which we come out of this is going to be potentially less contentious and less consequential. I mean, in the long run, in terms of sort of like our how society is going to be structured, the exit strategy is incredibly important. But in terms of you know immediate loss of life, it was that timing for going into the lockdown that was so essential. Um, but the bit that worries me more is that this is Keir Starmer trying to say, um, I would not have accrued as much debt as you because I would have you know found out an exit strategy sooner. And that sounds to me like someone, and this is, you know, this is not Keir Starmer's words, but presumably St Stephen Bush has got contacts in, in Starmer's operation. This sounds like someone buying into and being ready to operate on the narrative of austerity, which is to yeah. say that governments are like households. And if a, yeah. if a government spends lots of money f in one six month period, it's going to have to spend the next five years paying that money back. Mm. And not only is that economically illiterate, that's politically catastrophic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a great guest on last night. Uh, you, you were kind enough to feedback. You said it was a fun interview. You know, you can never really tell when you're, you're conducting the interviews. Mm. Adam Toos, he's just a great guy. And, you know, he put it really clearly. What we need to now do, uh, what we need to do after 2008, really, what we now need to do, particularly after the coronavirus, is do not worry about deficits. Deficits are not a problem. If you're faced with a pandemic, like a war, mm run deficits. Nobody confronted with a war scenario says, look, we have to run a fiscal surplus. You have other things to worry about. It's the same in a pandemic. Uh, run deficits, keep economic life fundamentally the same as it is in terms of you know basic necessities, energy, housing, food. Um, keep things ticking over. Adam talks about all of that. Uh, and of course, give an appropriate public health response. And OK, that, that means we're going to have a debt to GDP ratio. We'll probably end up with a debt to GDP ratio let's say in 2024 of like 120 percent right because growth can be permanently lower for mm. a couple of years and that's that's quite high historically by in terms of peacetime after the second world war is about 250 percent but you know uh, we're not coming out of a war right but it's been it's been that high before but adam too says well all you need to do is basically kick up inflation to five six percent you have increases in what he calls what is called historically nominal gdp growth which is an increase in economic activity powered by productivity gains primarily, because we're not having lots of people immigrate here. We're getting more goods and services produced because how much we each produce per hour goes up. At the same time, you get inflation. The inflation allows the value of the debt to come down, um, as he calls it. What is, um, how should we understand inflation? Inflation is an invisible tax on any, any, anybody who has a sort of monetary 
obligation over somebody else, like a form of debt. So if, if you owe 200 grand as a mortgage, high inflation suits you uh, because that 200,000 pounds actually in real terms relative to what you earn becomes less the higher inflation is, uh, as long as your wages are obviously going up with inflation too. Uh, so the inflation thing is really, really important. And that's basically what happens after the Second World War. High growth, high inflation. Now, Adam Tooze says that can't happen this time. It hasn't happened since 2010 because we've destroyed labor. We've destroyed organized labor. So wage bargaining has gone sort of is just disappeared as a result of political attacks in the last 20 years. We can't get inflation. Actually, we've seen we've seen trillions of dollars created in the last 12 years from central banks, just you know, injected into the economy primarily by recapitalizing banks, the banking and financial system. And yet inflation hasn't gone up. You've got loads more money and yet the same amount of goods and services, or in fact, in a pandemic, fewer goods and services, and yet inflation is still very low. Why? Because of the problem of uh, of not having wage bargaining for working people. So for all that to be, and Adam Tooze is not a socialist. Adam Tooze is a liberal. He's a smart liberal economic historian, right? Uh, and so it's concerning that a, at a politician of a centre-left party is still basically using the same frame uh, of somebody politically speaking, would be to the right of Adam Tooze, who's got great politics, by the way. Uh, somebody, you know, uh, it would have been a bad centre-left response in 2008. In 2020, it's a terrible one. Mm. I mean, Adam Tooze was also talking about on, uh, at the end of that show, he was saying how the necessity of talking about functional finance, um, which is, I suppose, the idea, it's, it's very close to modern monetary theory, right? The idea that if um, printing money doesn't cause inflation in, in a particular period of time, there's no reason not to do it. And so Adair Turner, who I think used to be director of the Financial Services Authority, incredibly yeah. intelligent guy, I think he's a conservative. Uh, he added this, this book called Between the Debt and the Devil. And the idea was that if you allow sort of central banks to just print money for governments whenever they want it, that will be a temptation that governments can't resist and you might end up having um, runaway inflation. So you do need to have responsible finance. But if you have a central bank which decides when it thinks money can be printed without, you know, bringing about inflation, and we have an independent central bank, then you should probably let it do it. And obviously, there isn't going to be much moral hazard if debt from COVID-19 gets written off, because hopefully we're not going to have another global pandemic. And also, I mean, we're not going to get runaway inflation, because as Adam Tooz was talking about, it's low inflation that's a big problem here. So what it does seem like you can do is huge amounts of these debts that the government is currently accruing. You get the Bank of England to buy them off the government, um, give them incredibly long maturation periods and very low interest rates and basically forget about it. Um, so this idea to reinforce this frame, and you're already seeing it from people like Laura Koonsberg, like this this will become a dominant narrative, this idea that we are going to have to pay back all of this money. Um, we can't. We can't, yeah. We, I mean, can't. And, we can't. And we don't need to. No, but even if you want, I mean, this is the thing, it's not, even if we wanted to, because, again, it's a pandemic, this is not, oh, right, you've got sovereign debt is going up, but actually private households are, uh, have less debt. Or in 2008-10, you know, basically we socialised financial debts onto the, asset, uh, the asset sheets of, of, of banks, basically, were socialised and uh, became sovereign debt. This time round, sovereign debt's going to be high, private sector debt's going to be high, banking debt's going to be high, personal household debt's going to be Everybody's in debt, right? So when everybody's in debt, you, you can't, do austerity anymore by the way in 2000 before 2008 one of the reasons why you could socialize all of those problems was because fundamentally most western economies had very low levels of debt to gdp you know britain i think had like 40 50 percent debt to gdp you can say oh well our banking systems collapsed uh we'll bail them out bail them out do a bunch of things and okay it'll be 80 percent in five years but then we can lower it again that, that opportunity is not there this time so even if they it is so economically illiterate right i mean it always was uh, but if everybody is in, is in historic levels of debt, you, it doesn't work. We're going to have to have inflation. We're going to have to have haircuts. We're go we have We're gonna to have to cancel a lot of this debt. Yeah. And there is no moral hazard because it was a pandemic. No one's going to like intentionally start a pandemic so they can write off some debts in the future. I hope not. Um, also, actually, I wanted to mention, so one of the problems that I think Keir Starmer's, and again, I don't want to be unfair to Keir Starmer. He's the leader of the Labour Party. I want the Labour Party to win the next general election. He'll presumably be the Labour leader then. And even if he loses, I mean, there's not much to suggest he's not going to get replaced by anyone more right wing than himself. I'm not here to try and destroy Keir Starmer like those people in in Labour HQ were trying to destroy Jeremy Corbyn. But I do think that there are a number of concerns and weaknesses in his performance so far. And one of them actually was 
you know, came across in. So there was a Zoom call that him and Angela Rayner um, were both on earlier this evening. Me and Aaron were both watching it. And there was a question that he was asked by someone in the, in the audience about the disproportionate number of BAME people dying from COVID-19. So the people, disproportionate number of black people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds who are dying from coronavirus. And it's a really important question. Um, real, you know, opportunities are weird phrase to use in this context, but sort of a question to which the Labour Party and the leader of the Labour Party should have so many answers. You know, the reason why black people are disproportionately affected by coronavirus is because they're more likely to work in frontline jobs. They're more likely um, to have less bargaining power in the workplace because of structural inequality in this country um, so that they can't demand to work from home, more likely to work in the NHS, uh, more likely to be poor. And you are more likely to suffer from coronavirus if you're poor. You're more likely to catch it because it's harder to self-isolate from other people in your families. Um, as I've already suggested, it's harder to, to stay off work. There are loads of answers about the interaction of class and coronavirus that also show that you've thought about race issues, which is quite important given that your party um, leaked yeah. a document on the weekend which showed how endemic um, anti-blackness and racism has been in the highest echelons of that political party. And his answer was, oh yes, we've. I think that's a very serious issue and we've got to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, I mean, it it's, was a, like, it's a it's a loyally answer, and I understand yeah. to say like, I I'm not saying I know the answer to that question. It hasn't been confirmed. More research needs to be done. But if you can't at least, you know, suggest what are some of the possible answers, because it's not like a weird, it's not an unknown unknown. Yeah, you know, in Donald Rumsfeld's words, sort of, we can see what the various options are, and unless you can talk about that coherently, it just seems like you don't give a shit. Yeah, that's so well. That's so well put. Let's talk about Rumsfeld, blast from the past. I mean. The thing with Starmer is he's he's a brilliant lawyer, right? Uh, but the question is, does a brilliant lawyer make for a brilliant political strategist or even a, a brilliant politician? And we see this with the the exit strategy thing as well. I mean, maybe by by a process sort of perspective, maybe it's a, a good thing to talk about. Uh, we can maybe dispute the extent of that. But I think you see it more with this. You know, Keir Starmer cannot comprehensively say beyond any shadow of a doubt these three people died, Bane people died in a particular way because their racial status intersected with their economic status. He doesn't know that for sure, so he won't he won't sort of insinuate that. He's you know, he's a details guy, you know. Uh, he he won't make a claim he can't be and you know, sometimes that's good. During the leadership election, people say, "Are you a Zionist?" He said, "I just think that's a kind of strange question to ask of somebody who's not Jewish and who's British." Um I think it's quite odd. Uh, so you know, it, I'm not necessarily it's purely a negative thing. It might be a very good trait you'd want in your attorney general or in a mm. chance in a chancellor, but a leader of the opposition, a prime minister. I think, I think one of a few things will have to happen. Either he's going to have to dispense with that and change. And look, leaders change in leadership roles all the time. Or the what what seems to be tried at the moment, what they're going for. You saw a little bit with him and Angela Rayner tonight. Is that Angela Rayner will kind of fill those gaps, right? Mm. Angela Rayner is young. He's older. She's northern. He's from the south. She's a bit more. She's got a bit more of a populist touch. He doesn't. He's a details guy. So I, I see how they can work as a package. Uh, but no, I, I I agree with you. It's very. It felt to me like something from the past. Because even like a Hillary Clinton or Joe uh, Joe Biden. I mean Joe Biden can barely finish sentences. Joe Biden five years ago would have said, yeah, well you know obviously black folks their economic kind of status is a little bit different to white folks. Uh, Ed Miliband would have said something like that, probably. Mm. And so to hear it, it doesn't make Keir Starmer a bad guy, but it's just not, he, he's clearly not uh, sort of immersed in the in the the ideas and the values and the, the conversations of the 21st century left. Well, I just think he seems underbriefed on everything. So, I mean, every, one of the reasons I sort of link that in the with, the with the coronavirus discussion is because it's similar with things like an exit strategy. So I wouldn't really expect... Um, a Labour leader to stand up at this point in time and say, this is our five-point plan for getting out of the lockdown. One, because there's a, a huge degree of uncertainty at the moment, and it would be dishonest to do that because no one, you know, we shouldn't have a, a set five-step five plan to getting out of the lockdown. And also it makes you a massive hostage to fortune um, because anything the government does, they can say, well, we counted the cost of what you were going to do, and ultimately mm. that would have been worse. So, so I, I don't think you should be making yourself a hostage to fortune and pretending there's certainty where there isn't. But at the same time, unless you can put 
front and center the idea that these are the options we need to be discussing. These are the possible alternatives. These are the pros of this option. These are the pros of this option. It just seems like you haven't really thought about the issue. And we've now seen that on coronavirus. We've seen that on exit strategies. We've seen that on race. And it's, you know, getting a bit worrying at this point. Well, he's, he's been a cipher. I, I, you know, a lot of people at the center don't like to hear it. But there's been a hell of a lot of projection with this guy. You know, people that were backing Jeremy Corbyn, they knew his limitations and often they might try and divert attention away from them or, you know, mm. pray to God he improves or whatever. I think unlike Ed Miliband, Keir Starmer's biggest problem is that they're very high expectations. You know, he looks the part. He's been a former director of public prosecutions. He's a sir. He's been outstanding in his field. And people think, this guy, yeah, he's mm. our guy. And then he's like you say, he's kind of like not very well briefed. He's only been in politics for five years. Um, and he... He isn't that impressive. He just isn't that impressive. He may grow into it. You know, people grow into leadership roles, you know, and like you say, I want the guy, I want the guy to be the next prime minister. Uh, but I mean, we should say, I mean, he, he does have a good, I mean, the plus for Keir Starmer, and you have to admit it, is that he's now on plus 26 in terms of net favorability. Now, I mean, from the discussion we've just had, we might not think he's necessarily earned that in terms of the, the points he's put forward at, like now. Yeah. Um, but apparently that's the highest favorability rating any leader has had since the early days of Tony Blair. I don't so... think fav I don't think favorability I don't think I don't think it means anything because uh, Labour, for instance, from like 2000 through to 2010, barely their approval as a, as a political party was always negative. I just don't think it means anything. You know, well, it's... In, I just don't. I just I just I just don't think it does. I, I, if you I look disagree with that. Well, I no. think it. I think at the moment, his favorability is incredibly soft. I think people don't really know much about him other than that he looks like a professional politician and he's replacing someone they didn't really like, which, and he's the sir, and he rose to the top of his, well, you know, he looks, that, good, he looks good on paper and he's being given a bit of an easy ride at this point in time. But and the, that same, that same poll said that 59% didn't know. That's the first thing to say. So most people actually, because most people aren't that involved or engaged in mm -hmm. politics, don't really know. So first of all, the sample's not really big enough. Secondly, I've just said that they don't matter. Here's why they don't matter. Every single leader right now in the global north is seeing their approval ratings rocket, mm. with, the, with the exception of Donald Trump, because we're, we're in a crisis situation. So people shouldn't look at approval ratings purely as a reflection of good governance. There's a bunch of variables. Margaret Thatcher's approval ratings, all-time high. When was it? 1983, the Falklands War, right? So... There's a bunch. There's a bunch of things going on, and so so the, the approval ratings. I don't. What was Atlee's approval rating in 1945? You know, I I do think it's a strange frame, and people are, are pointing at because I think it works both ways. People are pointing at Labour's poor polling. So, well, Starmer's been in for a week. You know what? Starmer doesn't need to worry about opinion polls for six months. Mm. Realistic, he shouldn't. If he wants mm. to imprint his agenda, who he is, his project. Forget the polls. Forget the approval ratings. So I'm not saying I ignore that because I, I disagree with them. I'm saying I ignore that because I think actually if he wants to succeed and win, a bit like Boris Johnson for the first couple of months, right? Boris Johnson wasn't trying to be popular. He wasn't trying to win the air war on a day-by-day -day basis. He knew I need to get a deal, which May couldn't get, and I get it past my backbenches, and I screw the DUP, and I'll win a general election. I don't care about who won that 20... Oh, no, led by donkeys, managed to get 20,000 retweets yesterday. Oh, wow, Dominic Cummings is an asshole, trended on Twitter. I don't care. I have this thing in mind. And and that's what Keir Starmer now has to do. So he shouldn't he shouldn't give two, uh, two figs about his personal ratings or about uh, Labour Party's uh, sort of performance in polls for six months. Um, we're going to move on to the next section. First of all, I just wanted to point out we were speaking about the disproportionate number of BAME people dying from coronavirus. We've got someone on, on Friday who is passionate about that and very knowledgeable about that, Dr. Sonia Adesara. So we'll be talking about that more then amongst other issues, including PPE, etc., um, there are about 1,900 of you watching this. We want to get at least 2,000. 2, We've got 2,000. They're 2,000 already. Okay, we've got we're to set the bar high. We want to get 2,500 watching the show. So uh, there is a description in the YouTube um, description. Sorry. No, there's a link in the YouTube description. I got those words in the wrong order. Um, so you can retweet that, and that will bring more people into this show. Um, also, obviously, smash the like button. And... You all know Navarra Media, Tiski Sour is only possible because of your kind support. If you are already a subscriber, thank you very much. You make this possible. If not, please go to navarramedia.com forward slash support and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month or give us a lockdown bonus. We appreciate it more than anything.
Um, we are going to now talk about the leaks, um, partly, you know, framing it in terms of Keir Starmer's response to it. Um, how have the Labour leaks interacted with Keir Starmer's style of forensic opposition? Um, and we spoke about this, you know, obviously in detail on Monday's show. Starmer is promising an independent investigation into the circumstances of the document's creation, its contents and its leaking. Uh, he fielded questions about the leak on Sky this morning. Are you prepared to eject people from the party who are actively undermining your predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn? I'm not going to preempt the outcome of this investigation. I've set it up. I want it to be speedy. Um, and I'll obviously look at the result when we get it. But I'm not going to preempt that. Uh, I'm actually going to defend Keir Starmer in this moment. I've seen some people sort of say that his responses in public have been a bit weak. I think it's legitimate as an aim um, for when Keir Starmer is publicly speaking to try and kill this story as, as quickly as possible. Because mm. I think quite rightly, you know, the public are going to be watching the new leader of the Labour Party and what they want to hear about is his plan, um, his concerns when it comes to COVID-19. Obviously, I've already discussed why I think sometimes Keir Starmer falls short on that count. But I think the idea that you give an answer which covers all bases, but which doesn't create any headlines is is probably for the best in this situation. And to say we're going to have an inquiry which does look into, you know, all three of the areas which are relevant when it comes to this report. I think we'd probably want the emphasis to be on the content of the report. Um, there'll be some right-wingers in the Labour Party who would like the emphasis to be on the creation of the report and the leaking of it. But I think, you know, all three of those things are legitimate areas for inquiry um, for Keir Starmer to have some oversight of what's going on. Um, Aaron, what do you think of of that answer there, he was not committing to whether or not anyone would be expelled for actively undermining a general election. I think that's a reasonable thing to say on Sky News. Um, I would hope that he would kick someone out for trying to actively undermine a general yeah. election. But I mean, what do you think here? No, I, I agree with you. I think obviously you should. I mean, the, the reason why people work for, join political parties, volunteer for them, stand for them, you'd hope is that they form a government. Um, otherwise, why is everybody wasting their time? Uh, and I'm sure he thinks that too. I think any reasonable person thinks that. Uh, and of course, with some of the people in this document, it's subjective. Others, it's, it's a pretty clear cut case, explicitly saying things to the effect that, you know, they're, they're gutted about how well Labour are doing. Um, and they're worried about the possibility of even uh, Labour entering a government. So uh, I agree with you. He has, to, he has to try and kill it publicly. However, I mean, the question is, is this the best way to do it, I suppose? You know, you could perhaps imbue it with a bit more humour. You know, you could say, oh, the Labour Party is always fighting, but I take this very seriously. I don't know. Uh, but fundamentally, I think we're on the, we're of a mind here. I think you, the cliche right now, it's 70% of the electorate. And the thing, what's really important is that Labour Party members, you keep, keep a moral compass. You don't do everything second guessing 70% of some fictitious electorate you never know. Uh, and also you do need to hold the leadership up to some moral sort of basic moral demands and basic morality, like anti-racism, right? An anti-racist Labour leader will get rid of quite a few people in that document if they've been found to have done what they've done, been alleged to have done. Um, so I think there's a few things there. On the one hand, I agree with you. Uh, you know, he, he, he needs to make sure it sort of play down the story to a significant part of the electorate. At the same time, you know, he does need to set a moral example, given the problems exposed by that very same report. So, uh, yeah, particularly on racism, you know, you cannot have white, middle-aged, powerful staffers, unelected people, undermining, disparaging, engaging in the targeted harassment of black MPs uh, and that not be called out on, on the media. And I know what you're saying, you know, he doesn't want to make it a big story. Well, you know, lots of uh, MPs were happy to make uh, other things very big stories when it probably wasn't in the party's interest, okay? You could argue when it came to Brexit, he was one of them, for instance. Uh, you could argue with regards to some, some other MPs. Some people made useful interventions with regards to anti-Semitism. Some absolutely did not. Some were absolutely trying to uh, make the problem worse rather than make it better. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's about, do you trust the guy? It's like so much, right? If you think he's got good intentions, you'll, you'll see good intentions. If you don't, you won't see good intentions. But I agree with you fundamentally. He, he doesn't need to be addressing this through or via the media. He needs to be addressing it uh, through concrete steps taken uh, with regards to internal party management. And in terms of concrete steps, I suppose in that clip that you just saw, he said he wouldn't expel someone for trying to throw a general election. But we potentially have seen some 
movement uh, when it comes to people who appeared in that document. So Ian McNichol, General Secretary of the Labour Party up till I think early 2018, very much implicated in that document as someone who had no intention of Labour winning a general election. He was a whip in the House of Lords, a government whip, and he has today stepped back from that role. Um, so we can go to a tweet from Heather Stewart. Um, she was responding to a tweet from Patrick Maguire, who noticed that McNichol had been taken off the list of front benches circulated to Labour MPs. Let's go to that tweet now. Um, I'm hearing Ian McNichol has decided to step aside as a Labour whip in the Lords following the publication of the Labour leaks report. I suppose it's not. It wasn't that much extra content in that tweet. But in any case, um, I mean, this is I suppose this is a good sign, right? There's that that someone's that there has already been some consequences to people who are who were once mm. at the very top of the party. I think he should be. I think put, put your head up. Any other organization in the world? I don't know where our, our audience are. What, what's your job? Where do you work? Imagine if you were exposed uh, to be fundamentally undermining the basic mission of the organization you work at. Imagine. And there was an investigation. Mm. Would you be suspended pending investigation in 99% of workplaces? Yes, absolutely. Anybody in the private sector or in the public sector would, would be subject to that. For some reason, the Labour Party seems to operate by a whole different set of rules. Who you're friends with, who you know, what faction are you in? I think it's entirely legitimate to say he should be suspended pending investigation, as should everybody in that report. doesn't mean they're all guilty. You can have an assumption of innocence until proven guilty and say you're suspended pending investigation because they're serious allegations. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily a good sign at all, actually. I think it's just one person doing it in an ad hoc basis is probably a bad sign in so much as it's obviously a good thing, uh, but it's a bad sign more generally because it shows there's not really going to be any collective steps taken. It sounds to me more like um, media management. It looks bad. This guy is, you know, whipping the House of Lords. And I don't, I don't think that's good enough. I don't think him recusing himself from his duties, given the scale of what's being alleged, is sufficient. All right, yeah, I buy that, to be honest. I want to move on to, uh, there was something that you mentioned on Monday, which was the first I'd heard of it, so we didn't really talk about it that extensively, um, but which has now been picked up by the mainstream media. Um, this is a quote from Shabab Khan's article. He's a journalist with ITV. So in one case, a senior Labour staffer had sent themselves their entire WhatsApp conversation history, which included group chats of colleagues at Labour HQ discussing their opinions about Corbyn and Labour's performance at the 2017 general election. So obviously you were, you were ahead of the game on this, on this story, Aaron, <laughs> but it is absolute confirmation that the reason we have all of these messages available is because someone was stupid enough to download all of these incriminating messages onto their work email address. Yeah, and it's going to also like, legally... Yeah, go on. Like, I mean, we were saying on, on Monday, like, how do people this sort of immature and obnoxious and horrible rise to the top of their field? I mean, how do people this stupid rise to the top of their field? Like, what the, what the hell was... What what were the, you know, the qualities of these people that let them rise up? Because I can't see any at this point in time. It's an indictment. I've said this before. I think it's it's... It's embarrassing and shameful for the Labour movement, for the Labour Party. These people had these positions because it's an, it's an indictment on, on the Labour movement. Like you say, nasty, malevolent people, uh, but also incompetent, you know, quite quite useless, you know, sort of uh, pathologically, compulsively tweeting odd things about people. You've got a job to do. You're a, you're a director. You've got an OBE. You know, if an intern was doing that, and of course an intern should be paid a living wage, an intern on day one, you would, if they were doing that, you'd say, look, you need to get out the door right now. But it's the director of the organization, one of the directors of the organization, or in McNichol's case, the top, the top dog, general secretary. Um, but this has this has legal implications too. Uh, obviously, there's there's two sides to the legal case with regards to how this goes forward. First is is anything libelous. Uh, second is the data protection element. Uh, and as I understand GDPR, there's a data controller that will be people within the Labour Party, etc. They are fundamentally. Um, responsible for the protection of, of somebody's data. There's a difference between leaking something and publishing it and so on. So it's very, very complicated. But why this makes a difference is because if you email somebody from a work email, it will often say, you know, there's often a policy, it's the property of your workplace. Uh, and so there's something substantially different about these WhatsApps being in a work email that may actually be a big legal issue in terms of the Labour Party may actually help their case if there is a case that comes forward on this. 
that is Labour Party property in a way that if somebody had, say, been a snake in the group and then leaked them, these are these are fundamentally different relationships in, in terms of how they've managed to access them. That's not talking about then how they're distributed going forward, but how they managed to access them in the first place. So it's a big, big thing. And I mean, what a screw up. Can you imagine? Yeah, I get it. they must be really hated by everyone else who was in that WhatsApp group. Amazing. Um, Aaron, you've been, I know, following sort of some of the fallout within Labour HQ about these revelations. To introduce this discussion, I'll go to a tweet from Gabriel Pogrand. Um, to be honest, there is within this tweet, there is a whole letter from the GMB branch within HQ. As I understand it, there's quite a large GMB branch and quite a large Unite branch. The letter is very long, so I'm actually just going to read to you his summary. Um, GMB Labour Party staff branch released statement blasting leaked report saying it's caused immense stress to workers and that inclusion of private messages is unacceptable. Also says private comments while absolutely indefensible and not being seen within context. I'm not really sure what, I, to be honest, actually, we in, we provided the context to one of those tweets on Monday, which was the Diane Abbott crying in the toilet yeah. when they're telling... Um, who was it? Who were they to? Michael Crick yeah. about her location. The report didn't have the context. Yeah. What was the context? It definitely didn't make it seem yeah. like a less awful thing to do yeah. because you don't the want context the context. Was, you don't want the context. The context was that she was crying because she'd had rape and death threats that week, right? The mm. context does not help you, my friend. Um, but can you talk a bit more about you know the, the the fallout? What's going on here? You've got your ear to the ground. Yeah, I might do a piece on this. Let's see. Uh, so you've obviously got two uh, Labour staffers uh, party headquarters are covered by two unions, GMB and, and Unite. And what the what the right try to do is they they join both unions. You know, often with people on the Labour right are very strange. They look at um, they look at uh, affiliated organisations or trade unions almost like um, I don't know, like uh, Top Trumps or like a, a Panini sticker album. You just have to collect all of them, and uh, they'll join the Fabian Society, they'll join Progress, they'll join Compass, they'll join they'll join everything. So there are people that join both Unite and the GMB. Um, they've come to fundamentally different um, uh, sort of conclusions here. So the GMB has an exec, like in a constituency Labour Party, you have an executive composed of different people, elected positions. The GMB exec decided to publish that statement without consulting their members. So it's completely undemocratic. Uh, and in the words of one activist, this is not how you run a trade union. This is more how you, you know, these these people aren't press officers for themselves. They're meant to be conduits for, for democratic accountability and workplace representation for us. Uh, so that, that's the first thing. That's the GMB. Like I say, there was no real um, uh, sort of consultation with, mem uh, with members, with workers represented by GMB. Unite today, and it's they said those ridiculous things, no content, uh, context rather in terms of the messages, uh, there was a massive emphasis over the leaks rather than the actual substantive uh, claims and evidence in the in the original document. Obviously, both matter, but I think it's clear there's a huge public interest in terms of the, the document and what it and what it has within it. Unite, on the other hand, they had a meeting that was today this afternoon. They had a vote, uh, and basically they concluded entirely different things to the GMB. No surprise what happens when you actually consult people democratically. They don't say such ridiculous things as people who operate enclosed internal factionist cliques. Uh, so the Unite uh, branch instead said, we want to send a letter of solidarity to Diane Abbott, uh, Clive Lewis, Dawn Butler. We want to have uh, mandatory uh, sort of internal bias testing for everybody in the organization. We want something that resembles an audit with regards to race relations in the organization. And we want to basically open the books when it comes to uh, race related cases within the organization. How bad is this problem? particularly uh, in respect to anti-black racism, which really sh it sticks out in, in those accounts. Uh, so very different responses from the GMB and from Unite, uh, but we shouldn't read too much into that, like I said. It doesn't mean one half the workforce thinks something, one half thinks another. It's that one consulted workers, the other was a small group of people effectively uh, briefing something to a Sunday Times journalist. I like Gabriel Pogren. That was the journalist in, 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 I'm talking about. I actually like him. I think he does good work. Obviously, I disagree with him politically on everything. Uh, but I, I respect journalists who go to people for comment. And, and, and Gabriel does that. A lot of people don't. Uh, but uh, that's that's no way to run a trade union branch. Um, the reason I'm grinning is because we're talking about the fallout from this document. And there has just been a new comment this time from Clive Lewis MP who tweeted the, uh, this at 8.07. 
Uh, so he's he's screenshotted. This must be a write up of, of of the fallout, which says the Labour MP Clive Lewis, who is referred to in one message by a member of Labour's governance and legal unit as the biggest cunt out of the lot, urged Starmer to get to grips with the culture inside the party. I didn't know whether to bleep myself out there. I decided not to, as you could already read the whole word there. Um, Clive Lewis quote tweets this saying, if you're going to do something, do it well, I say. As can be seen, I'm not just any old cunt. I'm the biggest one of the lot. Hashtag no half stepping. So, I mean, I think you can see that. I mean, because so many big name MPs were sort of named in this and the treatment of them was so you know, appalling, I do think that is going to increase the impact of, of this report and quite rightly mean that it's going to be harder to brush it under the carpet. But also, look, this is this is how right wing these people are. They were attacking Yvette Cooper and like Angela Smith, you know. So the, the, there's little, like, it's going to be they're going to be very hard pressed for MPs to come out and bat for them. You know, there's going to be very few of those. It might be 10, mm. 20, 30. But mm. I think they've burned it by the looks of it. These are the kinds of people that burn lots of bridges. I'm it sure says some... that, it says in there they think anyone to the right of Gordon Brown is a trot, didn't it? I mean, just remarkable stuff. Should we move on to a final topic before we go to questions? Yeah. We're going to jump over the discussion on third world debt. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a future show when we get Grace Blakely back on with good technology. Uh, for now, I want to talk about a big major story, uh, which is Donald Trump announcing he's going to defund the World Health Organization. Um, so we're going to start with a clip yesterday. This is from, I think he does daily press releases as well, press conferences, sorry. Today, I'm instructing my administration to halt funding of the World Health Organization while a review is conducted to assess the World Health Organization's role in severely mismanaging and covering up the spread of the coronavirus. Everybody knows what's going on there. I'm sorry, it's just too good. Even when it's incredibly serious, so like the, the USA withdrawing funding from the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic yeah. is evil. It's absolutely disgraceful. But then you watch the clip at the ends of like, everybody knows what's going on there. It's just like, yeah, it's... anyway, I'm, that's besides the point. I should tell you some details about the World Health Organization. Uh, so the World Health Organization is a UN body. It manages global pandemics and pursues healthcare projects in developing countries. It has a budget of around $5 billion. It's nothing um, for an organization which is supposed to you know, manage and coordinate global health. Um, I looked up today, I compared this to the US's stimulus. So the US stimulus was $2 trillion mm. um, for their country to deal with coronavirus. The WHO budget, the entire WHO budget is 0.25% of that. Right. So so the money going into the WHO is small fries. So sort of any any complaint people might have about the organization has to kind of be understood um, in that context. The US contributes um, 10 to 15 percent of its budget. Obviously, Trump's complaint is that the WHO is China centric. Um, he's saying they were too slow to sound the alarm on coronavirus. As we talked about on this show before, um, China were secretive about the coronavirus during December. Everything was made public in, in mid-January. And the WHO, I think, made it public as soon as they found out about it. And one of the reasons they're not, they're not allowed to publicly criticize anyone. Um, so that might be why they sometimes seem like they're soft on certain countries. Although there is an internal debate within the WHO as to whether the current um, general secretary of the organization should be a bit more assertive in terms of uh, demonstrating leadership as opposed to being as consensual as they, they currently right. are being. Um, but I suppose I wanted to link this to a broader question for you, Aaron, which is, you know, this is a sign of the forces of discord which have been unleashed by coronavirus, the biggest funder to the World Health Organization withdrawing from it. And you'd have thought that would have been one of the, you know, safer organizations, as it were, when it when it comes to this point in time. Do you think this is something we are going to see as an outcome of coronavirus increasingly, sort of like mm. countries becoming more... Well, oppositional is to understate it, but you know, multilateral organizations breaking down mm. amid the fallout from this virus. I think there's a very good chance of it. I mean, it's not just the World Health Organization. Early last year, the United States left UNESCO because of perceived, I don't know if you remember this, perceived anti Israel bias. Uh, that was also from Donald Trump. However, that wasn't the first time they left UNESCO. You know, there's been a very mm. fraught relationship between these institutions, multilateral institutions, and the United States for a very long time. 
And actually, that, that channels a much deeper, more historic American antipathy to these institutions. You know, the United States didn't join the League of Nations, for instance, despite Woodrow Wilson. You know, it was effectively his brainchild, his thing, following the, the First World War. So America's had a, a sort of default instinct to be uh, to distrust multilateral organizations, institutions. That, that's the first point. And they view it as a way, which it is, in a sense, uh, a restraint on their sort of global hegemony. Um, you look at the trade-offs with the IMF and the World Bank, one is headed up by an American, one by a European. Realistically, America is a far greater military and economic power than, than Europe is, just, just is. Um, so I, you can understand that, you know, the American first kind of ideology, why it would be at odds with those multinational institutions. And it's not old. Uh, but within the context of coronavirus, and we, we, we didn't quite get down to it yesterday with, uh, with Adam Tooze, we're not moving towards deglobalization. You know, right now, you and I are 100 miles apart. You know, people are watching this all around the world. In terms of a global culture, that's not going anywhere. Uh, but in terms of a, a multilateral global order of solidarity, collective action, of course, it never existed. Uh, but there, was, there, there were things that, you know, approximated that. And the question is, you know, we're, we're coming into, we've been in a difficult period really since 2008. Uh, it, when's it going to end? You know, and, and how many of these institutions are still going to be there? is a really vital question. You know, the League of Nations didn't survive the 1930s. Would the UN, I think it's, I think it's, that's a stupid historical analogy to say we're in the 1930s again, but clearly there were similar strains on the global system as what we're seeing now. Uh, so what's interesting and what's really unique about Adam Tooze's reading, he says at the very moment you see effectively the Federal Reserve being utterly integrated with the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, becomes the it basically is the backstop to the global economy, the global financial system, they will effectively lend unlimited amounts of dollars to anybody in a crisis situation from those countries. At the same time, the global south basically falls off the map. You know, who, who needs the WHO the most? It's the countries in the global south. Uh, so it's a it's a huge, huge question about the, the failure or the demise or the collapse of these multilateral institutions over the, over the next sort of 5, 10, 20 years. Uh, we're going to go to questions at a moment. So start typing your questions in the comment section with a rocket emoji or putting them on Twitter with the hashtag Tisky Sour. We love both. To be honest, though, we do prefer it when you put them on Twitter because it means that people who aren't already watching the show get directed over here. Um, while you're doing that, I mean, I suppose, yeah, th th this question about sort of global discord and multipolarity sort of like intersect in quite an interesting way. I was reading a very good Guardian long read on the World Health Organization and the controversies that have surrounded it. And one thing that was quite interesting is one of the most effective things that WHO has done is eradicate smallpox. Yeah. And when it eradicated smallpox, it wasn't that the world was in this, you know, incredibly consensual state. It was in the middle of the Cold War. But actually, the Cold War, whilst it, you know, was an existential threat to the to the you know the survival of of humanity you know yeah it's the downsides of it were massive there were some upsides which was that you had major powers who were competing with each other to try and seem like global leaders which meant that they sort of had to up their game a little bit and with the who they managed in that in that period of time to, to persuade the soviets to i think produce 25 million um, vaccines um, against smallpox, and then that sort of pressured the Americans into funding yeah. the the immunization program because you know they're competing with each other and they want to have influence in these countries. And a big problem when you had the United States as the unipolar power mm. um, in the world is that there was no pressure on them to even bother. Which is why you know they tried to have it all. They imposed on weaker countries the Washington Consensus, which they they knew was not going to be beneficial to those places, but they thought they could do. They could get away with anything because there wasn't any alternative, you know, magnetic force of attraction. And uh, that moment seems to be well and truly over. Well, also, it's one, of the, it's one of the hidden sort of stories of 20th century social democracy. You know, mm. there, is a, there are huge concessions to working people in, in mixed market capitalist economies like Western Europe. Why? Because you have this other way of running the economy not you know it, it's there it's been prototyped it works you might not think it's perfect you might think it's inferior but it it works actually until the 1960s it, it looked like it might even prevail uh, and so you're absolutely right there are there are clearly upsides in having multiple um ideal types of how you'd run society and then you know different societies can say would we rather approximate that one or, or that one uh, and i think we're, we're moving towards that now in the 21st century you know adam adam talks about european welfarist style 
American sort of laissez-faire free market capitalist style or this 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 new thing that the Chinese are creating? Uh, and what kind of model do different countries uh, want to kind of approximate? Mm. Uh, you know, the question is, do the Europeans have the hard power to back up their model? Uh, do the Chinese have the sort of they, the Chinese do not have the financial muscle. They don't have the equivalent of the Federal Reserve and Wall Street. So it's an interesting kind of uh, it's an interesting contest for ideological hegemony over the next couple of decades. We've got some questions. Midas Rashid asks, how would you advise Keir to attack the opposition? I presume that means attack the government. Um, a very good question. And again here, I mean, I, I kind of accept um, the idea that Keir Starmer shouldn't want to be seen as attacking the government for its own sake. I think in this time of crisis, you do have to walk a very fine line because if you seem like either you're celebrating when things are going wrong and things going wrong in this this current period means lots of people dying or when all your, you know, bothering to sort of contribute to the debate is sort of gotchas and I told you so is when what people are really yeah. looking out for is sort of constructive um, criticism which can push us forward, then it's it's perfectly legitimate to say, you know, these aren't normal times. We don't necessarily want to attack the government in the same sort of many, not the few um, sort of populist frames that we might have used in the 2017 general election, for example. But what you have to do is ask difficult and pointed questions. I mean, there's a few jobs that Keir Starmer has right now. He has to look, you know, just basically competent. He has to also look like an alternative government. And to look like an alternative government, you have to actually suggest stuff, right? And at the moment, all he's asking is for them to publish this, publish that, publish this, mm. publish that. What would you do? What would you do differently? Um, as the Labour leader, what he also has to do is make sh make clear that he is standing up for the ordinary working class people that are often forgotten in government policy. So there are people who are currently being forced to go into work where they can't socially distance and they don't have yeah. you know, the rights that mean they don't have the bargaining power, which mean they can sort of force their, their boss to furlough them so they can sort of stay at home and protect themselves and protect their family. Um, and they don't have a voice. They're not going to be given a voice by the mainstream media. They're not going to be given a voice by the Conservative Party. So that responsibility falls to you, Keir Starmer, as leader of the Labour Party. Yeah. And I think all of these things, other than the look sort of like lowest common denominator competent, which he sort of manages because of the way he speaks and his title, um, I don't think he's really fulfilling any of those roles properly. Well, Robert Shrimsley, think, yeah, Robert Shrimsley, the FC, who I do not rate as a journalist, sort of said... Oh, he passes the first glance test. You go, well, the problem is when you've got a leader of the opposition, people are, are gla glancing more than once, right? This isn't somebody mm. who's trying to look good in a, in a restaurant or in a bar. This is somebody who wants to run the country. So it, it, fundamentally, they're going to have to pass much more difficult tests than that. Um, <laughs> Something I was thinking with the exit strategy debate, actually, you know, that, that was the thing they chose. Um, I mean, this might sound cynical, but it's a serious point, actually. I mean, the Labour Party have historically struggled with older voters, right? And they found it difficult to find what is the issue that we can sort of bring older voters on side with. And we have currently got a government which has been criminally negligent when it comes to protecting yeah. older people. Criminally negligent. You know, you, you had about a month ago in the sort of herd immunity time, Boris Johnson sort of speaking to the camera and saying, and to older people who are most at risk, I'm going to level with you. Yeah. But then he didn't say, you know, he didn't say anything concrete whatsoever. You've got a situation where only today they announced that older people going from hospital to care homes now have to be tested. That means up to now, during the height of this pandemic, mm. people have been moving from hospital to care homes without getting any testing whatsoever. Does that sound like a government that values older people in their lives? Well, there's and a really... for me, for me, Labour should be shouting quite loudly about that. Yeah. Not in a sort of gotcha, we're yeah. here just to attack you way, but in a, it, they should be making sure that this is not forgotten and they should be setting the weather. Well, it's like when, you know, go back to that, we'll move on to another question in a sec. Uh, we're running a little bit over tonight. Um, you know, when, when Johnson said, I'm going to level with you, more people are going to die. Put a number on it. What was the number? When you said that on that mm. date, what was the number you were being told? Was it higher or lower than the 20,000 that Chris Whitty was saying would be a, a good a good outcome a couple of weeks ago? You know, it's remarkable. A fortnight ago, the Times was saying we were going to have 6,000 fatalities. I think or two, like two and a half weeks ago, less than three weeks ago. 6,000. Anyway, let's get on to some more questions. 
It was 100,000. I mean, I think is the best. Test. That's what yeah. Tim Shipman said it was. That was what yeah. they were being advised. But yeah, that should be a pointed question that you asked. Yeah. Although, I mean, that one might be a bit backward looking at this point in time. Maybe that, but you know, he sh he, there, there are a lot more tough questions he could be asking. I, I just think you, you're saying you're going to level with people. Okay, well, level with us. Yeah. Matthew Smith asked, will this Tory failure lead to calls for an early election? No, I don't think. I mean, I they'd mean, win the it anyway. Have, the Tories have a massive majority. And even if they were about to lose it, why would they have an early election? I mean, it, the reason we had an early election before was because the government had a very slender um, majority in 2017 and in 2019. That's not the case anymore. So I can't see why we wouldn't um, have this parliament. Can you imagine the stop, the, stop, the stop Brexit thing would come back and the Tories would get an even bigger majority then? Um, keep left tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Oh, this is a challenge to something I said earlier. Why is it reasonable for one of the focuses of the inquiry to be why, how it was leaked? Shouldn't Labour explicitly support whistleblowers when taking this sort of action? Fighting racism, misogyny and being elected are surely Labour's raison d'etre. So yeah. my answer to that is that, I mean, any organisation, there's a difference between working out how something was leaked and punishing the leaker. Right. So if, if you're an organization and you have a lot of protected information, um, you know, then it, I mean, it's it's sort of one of your basic responsibilities to work out how it doesn't get leaked as an organization. Yeah. You're, not, you're not supposed to let all of this confidential information get leaked. That is an organizational failure, even if sort of the outcomes from it are, are good. But more importantly, there is a genuine problem with this leak. And I think on, you know, I think it should have been published. But ideally, some of the names would have been redacted. Um, and that applies especially to people who were complainants, so people who made complaints sure. to the Labour Party about racism. They didn't ask to be part of, well, I mean, to be honest, some of them did, but most of them didn't ask to be part of this yeah. huge political row. And so the fact that now their names are circulating among any, everyone reading this document is unfortunate. And I think that probably does warrant it being something that comes up in or even, you know, uh, Katie Clark is called these mean things by somebody else, right? I mean, does, does she really, you know, is it nice for her, for people who've never heard of Katie Clark? Oh, Katie Clark was called this. Mm. I think I think senior directors, uh, you know, who've, who've, who've allegedly done these things, those people I think should be absolutely named. I think pu publicly elected, you know, uh, a Jeremy Corbyn or a Tom Watson or a Keir Simon, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying Ke Keir Simon's not in the document. I think a politician should definitely be in it and director level staff. I think junior staff, people who've made complaints, victims. I think they probably shouldn't be in the document. No, so I, th I think you're. I think you're absolutely right there, Michael. Angus Robertson tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Surely the nasty people involved in this report have been guilty of gross misconduct of the party and should be expelled immediately by the Labour Party. It's indefensible. Um, it's a good point. I definitely sort of agree with the sentiment. I mean, I'm not sure if gross misconduct is something which exists in the Labour Party rule book. Obviously, if these people were still employed by the Labour Party, then gross misconduct would be a reason for them to be fired. Um, but none of them work for Labour anymore. So if there were to be disciplinary proceedings, it would have to be something which um, purports to what's written in the rule book. I think you could probably quite easily say these people have brought the, brought the party into disrepute. But I'm, I'm not sure what in the in the rule book allows for these people to be expelled. Well, as members, as members, they could be expelled. Or are you saying as members of staff? No, I just mean I don't know what rule they've broken. I don't know. I don't know. Presumably I there is a rule that these people have yeah, broken. Yeah, depends. Depend, depends who, right? Can I just say before we go? By the way, we've got nineteen thousand. Nineteen thousand. Doing a pretty Patel again. One thousand nine hundred seventy-eight uh, people watching. We've only got one thousand likes. Uh, smash the like button, and once you've done that, hit the subscribe button too. We're gonna say one more question. Okay, go on. Yeah. Um, uh, do you think I was gonna wrap up? But we'll go, go on. for one more question. All right. Sorry. Uh, Paul C, do you think Starmer is positioning by focus group? And if so, is it better to do so and improve electoral chances or go by principle and shape the debate the way Corbyn did? What do you think? I'd go, uh, I'd go for a third way. Uh, so, I mean, you never want to be... I mean, I think you should see focus groups not so much as leading you where you should go, but you can sort of test out some of your ideas. Yeah. And I do think that Corbyn's leadership, one thing they really struggled to do was prioritise. They often announced things which were which seemed completely esoteric to most people. Um, they often didn't realize or didn't work out in advance what would be people's sort of questions and concerns about this policy. And that means that they weren't ready to rebut quick enough. Um, but the other problem, the other end of the spectrum is if you're completely led by focus groups. And, and one reason that's the problem is that you end up just following 
um, the political weather instead of making it. So under New Labour, this was a problem because you need left wing parties to also drag public opinion as well as follow it. If yeah. you only follow a public opinion, that opinion will get dragged to the right as it yeah. did. Uh, between 1997 and, and 2010 and that's yeah. that appears in all of the social surveys over that period so that's not just a sort of yeah. political theory hypothesis that's evidenced fact um the other issue is people aren't that honest in focus groups so in focus groups what people will say is we're sick of politicians fighting what we want is positive messaging what we want is sort of consensual politics etc cetera, etc cetera. that's what people say mm. what they actually respond to and what sort of motivates them to vote a particular way is often much more negative than that right so i think many sort of center-left politicians have made the mistake of taking people at their word in focus groups yeah. instead of recognizing that you know sometimes people say what they think people want to yeah. hear them saying as opposed to what they actually mean yeah yeah and and, and that uh, we can finish on that note you know for me I, I think the left fails to grasp how important anger is People, if you if you can't you know if you can't give your kids the life that they deserve, if you aren't earning as much money as you think you you, you merit, given how hard you're working, uh, if you can't get on the housing ladder and you're paying a, a, a shed load of money to a landlord every month, you deserve to be angry. The system's not working for you, and I, and I think sadly for for a long time, the left's allowed the 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 far right fundamentally, or certainly not the centre right, but the right to capture that sense of anger and channel it in the wrong directions. And the left has to understand that people are angry, but they're angry for a reason. It's often justified. How can we make this a productive thing? Uh, but I also agree, you need... Corbyn, you know, and you were saying much of it's esoteric, but same with uh, Sanders as well, more so with Sanders. Very little focus grouping. Actually, they got things right. I think you've got... They had a good gut instincts on a lot of issues. Uh, and I think the best politicians always work like that. Margaret Thatcher, um, for instance. But I think you're right. You you throw the focus groups on top of that yeah, to test different things, different frames, different messages. But the big politicians who, who change politics aren't aren't working off focus groups primarily. I mean, I, I suppose you say you say the left have a problem with channeling, and I think you could argue that some parts of the far left have sort of found the limits of where political anger gets you. But definitely the centre left goes too far in the other direction, which is to say, let's all just be completely consensual, and you end up sort of not saying very much i'm not can I, can I just clarify that i mean i'm not saying i'm yeah, not saying i'm giving you permission to be angry i'm saying you should feel anger let's use it productively in quite a civilized mm -hmm. you know way towards yeah, certain yeah, yeah, social yeah. social objectives i'm not saying you know let's all start shouting not, not saying that anyone people. who doesn't necessarily support the leader you want is in yeah. favor of mass death for example yeah um okay we're going to wrap up there tomorrow i'm going to be speaking to mika utrecht and megan day about their book bigger than bernie um, obviously, the context has wildly changed since they wrote the book, but it's also incredibly relevant because their point was how the movement moves beyond Bernie. You know, what was built in the Bernie Sanders campaigns that will live beyond it. Um, so we'll be talking about that also, you know, recent developments in the United States. There's a bit of a row going on at the moment because Bernie Sanders sort of seemed to suggest that it was a bit self-indulgent to not back Biden. So you've, if you're on Twitter as often as me, you might have seen the beef, uh, which is... You know, bouncing between people's different accounts on there. On Friday, um, we're going to have Dr. Sonia Adasara on. She's brilliant. Um, she's currently working on the front line against COVID-19. Very, very articulate. And we're going to be talking about PPE. Um, as I said earlier, sort of the disproportionate effects of coronavirus based on class and race. Um, it will be excellent. Aaron Bastani, thank My you for pleasure. joining me. Always, Always a pleasure. Much. Mm. Um, sorry again that we didn't manage to have Grace Blakely on tonight's show, but we'll get her on very soon. You're, you, you, you can trust us on that. Um, I've been Michael Walker. You've been watching Tisky Sour. Good night. Uh -huh.